fun for our memory verse. As I've told you before, it's so important to memorize Scripture, right? And memorize the, the text. You don't just say, well, I'll lift up my eyes onto the hills and come up my help. You have to say, verse number one, right? Psalm 121.1, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills and come up my help. Everybody see that? Um, Okay, let's begin. Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2. Let's say it. Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. Now remember, the psalmist is writing this from Babylonian captivity. He's writing this, the, the Jeremiah the prophet said that we're going to go into Babylonian captivity for 70 years. And of, of course, uh, they were weak. Uh, they were, uh, they didn't have the high priest there to teach them. They didn't have the oracles of God. And so they were looking for strength from God. And so we saw in verse 1, he says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. And we saw that that word hills is really the word mountain. And what did it refer to? Anybody remember? Mount Zion, Mount Moriah. This is where Abraham offered up his son. This is where Solomon ultimately built his temple. In fact, this is where David pitched the mobile tabernacle when he brought it uh, back into Jerusalem. Now, in verse number two, he says, My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. Now, there's two things here I want you to see. First of all, he says, my help cometh from the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. In other words, he's talking about the person of God. What's he speaking about? The person of God. Then he says, which made heaven and earth. He's speaking about the power and the position of God. Now, let me break this down for you a little bit. I don't want to confuse you. You need to know this. In the Scripture, In the scripture, there's the word Lord, and then there's the word Lord, uppercase, I mean lowercase and uppercase letters. Now the psalmist says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, of, from which cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Now, this word Lord here is the word Yehovah. What is it? We say Jehovah, but there's no J in the Hebrew. I want to explain this to you a little bit. On the high priest's turban, on his miter, on his head dressing, there were the letters, the consonants, I-H-W-H. So when you look at the high priest, he had these uh, consonants on his turban, Y-H-W-H. This was known as the Tetragrammaton. What was it known as? And I don't have time to go into it with it. <laughs> you, have, you have to look it up. The Tetragrammaton. What was it called? The Tetragrammaton. The problem was they couldn't pronounce it. They could not pronounce the W-H, I mean Y-H-W-H. And so what they ultimately did was this. In the, in the Old Testament, the word Lord here equals Adonai. And God, Elohim. Now, the word in the Old Testament, when you see a capital L, small o-r-d, lowercase letters, it refers refers to the strong covenant-keeping God. It refers to what? The strong covenant-keeping God, Adonai. His name is Lord. When you see it in uppercase letters, capital L-O-R-D, it is Yahovah. Now, in order for them to be able to finally pronounce what Y-H-W-H meant, what they did was they, they stole the vowel A and they stole the vowel E 
and he inserted it in here. I don't know if you can see that. I got the A here and here. And the real name for God, in fact, if you, if you have a Jerusalem Bible, it says Yahweh, Yahweh, or Yahovah, Yahweh. So they put the these consonants, they couldn't pronounce them, so they put the vowel, they stole it from Adonai, took the E from Elohim, and he got the name Yahweh or uh, um, Yahovah. The name Jehovah comes from the 16th century, when there's, because there was no J in the uh, Hebrew language, they had to uh, try to come up with something that the English people could read, so they made it Jehovah. Now, in, the, in our King James Version of the Bible, it does not say Yehovah because that's the Hebrew. They made it so you could read it in English, and it says what? Jehovah. Now, in Exodus chapter 6, verse 3, God said this to the children of Israel. He said, I have revealed myself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, El Shaddai, but not by my name, Yehovah. In uh, Isaiah 42, verse 8, God says, And this is my name. My name is the Lord, Yehovah. <clears throat> when we see in the New Testament God's name written in the foreheads of people, the seal of God, it is the, as found in the fourth commandment. I am the Lord God that made heaven and earth. I am who? I am Yehovah. I am Yahweh. God's real name is Yahweh or Yehovah. And so that is the uh, true name of God. Jesus was called Yeshua or Yahushua. Okay, you can see it's almost an offshoot of Yehovah, amen, because the Jesus <coughs> of the New Testament was the Yehovah of the Old Testament incarnate. So he says, my help cometh from the Lord. <clears throat> I'm not looking to an Israeli army to free me. I'm not looking for anybody else to come and give me help. I'm looking for Yehovah. And he said, which made heaven and earth. In other words, he shows his almighty power, his supernatural power, that he is the creator of heaven and earth. Everything you see came out of the mind of God. Beloved, if you folks who have some kind of degrees in, in science and you've ever looked at cells under a, a microscope, what they used to think was a simple cell, now they find that there's literally more than an electron, proton, proton, okay. What they find now that there's hundreds of little machinations, very complex. And I marvel all the time as I study, as I, as I see creation, I see how everything's independent on one another, that this great God, this great creator God, made all of this. It came from his mind. And every system is interdependent upon another system, amen, just like your body, by the way. So he says, my help coming from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. In other words, he says, if God can speak the word, speak everything into existence, this God can certainly help me. Amen? He says, I am looking to this God, the one that made heaven and earth. We did not evolve. That's a scientific impossibility. If you know anything about the first, second, third, and fourth law of thermodynamics, I always get a kick out of that. I'll never forget debating with a professor one time, and he was saying how he believed in evolution, blah, 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 blah. Well, you believe in science? He says, yes, I do. I believe in science. I said, you believe in the first law of thermodynamics? He says, what's that? And I said, well, basically, it's the law of cause and effect. A car has a car maker. A bridge has a bridge ma uh, maker. Creation has a... That's the first law of thermodynamics, cause and effect. The second law of thermodynamics is the law of entropy. What is it? Entropy. Everything degenerates into chaos. There is microevolution. In, look at a species. You can make a big dog with a small dog. You get a medium dog, but he's still a what? A dog. He's not a monkey, okay? But everything degenerates into chaos. If you took your wheelbarrow and you put it behind your garage all winter, you come out in the spring, it's not a brand new Rolls Royce. It's a rusty old wheelbarrow, amen? So what I'm saying is when you look at the laws of science, forget theology. 
it's impossible. It's utterly impossible. It takes more faith. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist or an evolutionist because it contradicts everything I've ever learned about science, let alone the scripture. So the psalmist says, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills from which cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. Now, YHWH on the high priest's turban, what was that known as? Begins with a T. What is it? Tetragrammaton. Say it. Tetragrammaton. Tetragrammaton. Okay. Okay, Psalm 121.2, let's say it. Psalm 121.2. My help comes from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. Mm-hmm, good. All right, let's say it again. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. That's not only true for the psalmist, that's true for you and I. Amen? All righty, as we begin our Sabbath school lesson on the general resurrection and the first resurrection. In fact, you may want to write that, just the general and first resurrection to shorten it up. Make sure it says Sabbath school because people uh, are watching and calling me. <laughs> I want you to open your Bibles up to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, chapter 20, and I'm not going to give you everything that I talked about last week because we need to move right along right here, but I I do want to do a quick review so we can understand this. Can we keep that door closed? It's just blinding me. Windshields, the sun reflected enough the windshields. Revelation, chapter 20. Let's begin with verse number 4. Revelation 20, and we're going to read right through to verse number 6. John says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which uh, had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, I taught you last week, whenever you study apocalyptic literature, you always interpret apocalyptic literature by the clear, plain text of the rest of Scripture. What happens today is Christians get this backwards. They will interpret the rest of Scripture by the book of the Revelation, and what they'll say is this. They'll say, you know what? This is new revelation. So even though Jesus talked about there was only one resurrection, even though Paul said there was only one resurrection, even though Job and Daniel said there was only one resurrection, well, we've got the apocalyptic literature here, and it says that there was a first resurrection. There must be more than one resurrection. Well, beloved, that's not how you interpret Scripture. That's, that's a gross violation of the law of biblical hermeneutics, and the, law, the analogy of faith, the law of first mention. And so we looked at Scriptures last week that showed us that there is one, I'm going to break my neck up here. There's one general resurrection of all the dead when Jesus Christ returns at the second advent. Now, they will not simultaneously, because the dead in Christ will rise first, but ultimately on that same day, the dead, uh, the unsaved dead will rise also. Now, the reason people interpret the first resurrection, meaning when Christ comes back, he will, uh, before he comes back, seven years prior to the second advent, he will secretly and silently rapture the saints off this earth and resurrect the saints 
and then at the seven years later, he will come back at the second advent, and he'll resurrect the dead saints, and he'll establish a 1,000-year millennial kingdom. Now, I'm not going to get into the millennial kingdom right now, only so much as to say this. Where did the early church ever come up with a premillennial kingdom? In other words, that when the Messiah came, he would set up a 1,000-year reign on this earth out of Jerusalem. Where did they come up with that? Well, remember, Christian theology was in its infancy. The Jews always believed when the Messiah came. Remember, they didn't believe in two advents uh, of the Messiah. They believed in two Messiahs. Messiah Israel ben David, ben David, the warrior king, and Messiah Israel ben Yosef, the priestly king, ben Joseph. So the Jews believed that when Messiah came to rescue them, he would set up a Jewish aristocracy on this earth in Jerusalem, and the, Jeruz, the Jews would rule over the Goyim. Say that word, the Goyim. You know what the Goyim is? It's the Gentiles, the heathen dogs, the Goyim. So the early church, the only theology they had until they could really study this out was they believed what the Jews believed. That when Messiah came, he would set up a 1,000-year millennial kingdom on this earth. Now, I can say this from having studied this in depth. By the end of the first century, many of the so-called church fathers that believed in premillennialism started shifting to what we know is amillennialism. In other words, there is no earthly millennial kingdom that Christ ascended to heaven and he reigns over the spiritual kingdom on this earth as taught throughout the Old Testament. And the reason they said that now, because they had all the scriptures, and they were able to do what you and I are doing, they were able to look up the resurrection, and they saw that there was only one general resurrection, so the first resurrection, whatever it was, couldn't mean a resurrection prior to a 1,000-year millennial kingdom on this earth. Yeah, in fact, that's an impossibility. Beloved, well, just think about it. In first, excuse me, Second Peter chapter 3, Peter says, when Christ comes back, there will be a great conflagration on this earth. Everything in the world will burn up. All the elements will burn up. Everything that man made will burn up. Who'd be alive to enter a millennial kingdom? So you can see, beloved, we need to stay with what the scriptures have to say and stop injecting into it our subjective thoughts. Now, the first resurrection, the word first I told you was the Greek word protos. It means first uh, uh, in the line of many. And the word resurrection is anastasis. That means a lifting up. Now that word anastasis is used not only literally for a physical and bodily resurrection, but it's also used for a spiritual resurrection. In other words, we were dead in Christ, and the Bible says we resurrected unto newness of life, anastasis. Was that a physical resurrection or a spiritual resurrection? So we have to look at the context to understand what's going on. Amen? Now, in verses 5 and 6, we just read them. I'm not going to read them again to you. What confuses many Christians is this, is their hyper-literal misinterpretation of what the words first resurrection actually means. And because of their literal hermeneutic, even of apocalyptic texts. Now listen, we believe in literal interpretation of Scripture wherever it's possible, amen? But there's many texts that are figurative and symbolic, and you can't interpret it literally. You'd be crazy. There's no beast with seven heads and ten horns, literally, is there? There's no scarlet howlet sitting on this seven-horned-headed beast riding around with mystery Babylon the Great on her forehead. That's a symbol. And so their, their hyper-literal hermeneutic, which they violate all the time. I can't tell you how many times I've debated with dispensationalist pastors and professors, and I've said to them, you believe in a literal hermeneutic? They said, yes, we interpret the Bible literally. I said, everywhere? Well, most places. I said, the seven-headed beast, is that literal or spiritual? Well, that's, that's, uh, that's uh, spiritual, figurative. So your literal hermeneutic there goes out the window. 
And there's other places in Scripture, not only symbolic and cryptic, but other places where God speaks poetically in Hebraisms, and you, you can't even, the trees uh, uh, of the field shall clap their hands. Is that literal? That's a Hebraism, all right? The mountains shall shout for joy. See, those are poetic sayings. So you can't interpret that literally. Context always declares it. Now, what I want to show you, beloved, is this here. Where they go wrong is they see the word first resurrection and they immediately assume that it's speaking about a bodily resurrection before the millennial kingdom occurs. But interpreting it this way totally ignores the symbolism of the apocalyptic book of, well, of Revelation as well as the context as the rest of the clear passages of Scripture, what they teach about the resurrection of the dead being a general resurrection that will happen at one time. Now, we looked at ten Scriptures last week. Did any of them teach that there was two resurrections separated by a thousand years? Not one. When Jesus speaks about the resurrection, he's quoting Job. He's quoting Daniel. You see, beloved, remember, uh, Martha knew she, that Lazarus would resurrect, she says, on the last day. Why? She believed in Job, and she believed in the book of Daniel. Amen? So what I'm saying to you is this, is that the dispensationalists, what happens is, in most churches today, they are, by default, dispensation. You get saved in a dispensationalist church, immediately you're a premillennialist, you believe in a seven-year tribulation uh, pre-tribulation rapture, and you never even really had a chance to study it out. But if somebody challenges you on that, it even has a remote understanding of the Word of God, you're going to be goose-stepping, because you won't be able to defend it. You'll have to twist and turn a lot of scriptures. Now, I told you, beloved, the book of Revelation is never meant to conform uh, a doctrine. It is always meant to confirm a doctrine that has been found in all the other clear passages in Scripture. Amen? Now, I'm taking my time with this because that is a principle that if you don't understand, you will get caught, uh, uh, carried away with the uh, error, I won't say of the wicked, but those who don't know, know what they're talking about. And you know, I was that way one time. <laughs> Probably still am. You guys are crazier than I am, most of you, right? Now, beloved, I want you to look at verse 6 again. Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. John says, Blessed and holy is he that hath part, watch what he says here, in the first resurrection, on such the second death hath no power. They should be, uh, uh, but they should be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now that phrase, priests of God, we're going to see is used several times in the epistles, and we are already priests of God. Not that we're going to be, we're already kings and priests of God. But what I want you to see here, beloved, is I want you to notice that the first resurrection here, look at your text, I want you to look at your text, is set against and opposite the second death. Say it again. The first resurrection is set opposite the what? The second death. Why are you saying that, Pastor? Because of this. It is the first resurrection that protects us from ever experiencing the second death. And so it is not a bodily resurrection because we know that the unsaved are going to be bodily resurrected. Amen? But they're still going to experience what? The second death. So the bodily resurrection will not protect them from the, uh, the judgment of God. They need the first resurrection to be protected from the uh, second death. Now, I want you to drop down to verse number 14. Revelation chapter 20, verse 14. It says, In death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Notice, beloved, the second death is the eternal death of death and of hell. 
The word hell there is the Greek word Hades. We say Hades. It's Hades. And ultimately, they're going to be thrown into the lake of fire. That's the final place after the judgment where all the unsaved people will end up. Now, beloved, I want you to notice here also that not only is it the eternal death uh, of death and hell on the day of judgment, but it's also the death of the souls that will be cast into the lake of fire. In other words, this is a spiritual operation by God. God is not going to resurrect the unsaved, give them a body, only to kill them again and burn them up. He's going to resurrect the unsaved, give them a body that is fit for the environs of the lake of fire where they will be tormented forever and ever. I even hate saying that because we... I don't want you to think of God as someone who wants to torment uh, people. God warns men, and he does everything he possibly can to save men. If man goes to hell, he'll have to trip over the cross. He'll have to trip over Calvary. He'll have to trip over the blood of Christ. He'll have to trip over the Holy Spirit. He does everything he can to save man, but man has to make a decision. Amen? You're either going to fish or cut bait. Who was on the Lord's side, Elijah said. Moses said, who was on the Lord's side? So we need to make a decision. Now, I told you, the unsaved are going to be physically resurrected. They're not going to receive a glorified body like we'll have, an incorruptible, imperishable body that will reflect and refract the glory of God back to God. In fact, in the book of Zechariah, Zechariah warns that when Christ re-enters the universe, that those who are not saved and glorified, their flesh will be consumed on their bodies, their tongues in their mouth, because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, 1 Corinthians 15, 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit in incorruption. So you have to have a glorified body to ever stand in the presence of God. Can you imagine Jesus in an earthly millennial kingdom, glorified in Jerusalem, ruling over people who are not glorified? Does that sound right to you? I mean, it's almost unthinkable. So, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this. A bodily resurrection is never going to save anyone from the second death. Conversely, the first resurrection is the exact opposite, and it protects us from the ominous fate of the second death. The first resurrection we're going to see is a spiritual resurrection. So stay with me now. The word first resurrection does not mean to imply or to infer that there will be other resurrections like that that are going to follow. Rather, the first resurrection is meant to show that this is a different kind of resurrection than the body, and it is the resurrection of the soul when we get saved spiritually to go to heaven and ultimately when we die to go into eternal life. The first re resurrection represents our eternal life in heaven, beloved, with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to prove that by rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, contextually here, the first res res resurrection represents two things. Number one, our rising with Christ from moral and spiritual death to moral and spiritual life uh, and eternal life when we get saved at our baptism. We go from death unto life. Amen? That is the first resurrection, but that's only part of it. Number two, beloved, the first resurrection is completed in our life at the moment we physically die when our soul now separates from the body and spiritually rises to that higher life, eternal life in heaven, to forever be with the Lord, to rule and reign with Him. At our death, our soul leaves the body and it rises to heaven to enter into a spiritual world and the state where God and Christ live and where we then receive that promised inheritance of eternal life. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, the Bible talks about how Christ sits with his, in his Father's throne 
and that we will sit with him in a, 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 our Father's throne when we die also. Our soul will go to heaven. Now, we're going to prove this. We're going to go through the scriptures. I'm trying to do this slowly so you can understand this. Now, I want to look at some contextual proofs, beloved, that confirm that this is not speaking about a bodily resurrection, but a spiritual resurrection to a higher life at death. In other words, I got saved. I was baptized. I died with Jesus. I resurrected with Jesus, right? But someday my physical body will die. And Jesus promised that those who believe in me would what? Never die. When I physically die, my soul sits out of my body and it goes to finally be with Christ forever and ever and ever in heaven, that eternal life, amen, that God has promised us. When Christ comes back at the second advent, he will bring our soul, he will reunite it with a new glorified body, and we will live on a new heaven and a new earth and a new glorified body. Praise the Lord. No more sickness, no more disease, no more crying, no more tears, no more taxes, none of that. Praise the Lord. Now, proof number one that I want you to see. I want you to look at verse number four. Verse number four. John says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. Now let me stop you there one second. The word thrones here is the Greek word thronos. Pay attention. I want you to understand this. It refers, uh, it is, I should say, excuse me, it's used some 40 times in the book of the Revelation. Each and every time it refers to thrones in heaven. I have looked up every reference, and many other better than me have looked it up also. Never once does the throne ever talk about an earthly throne that men sit on. And I want you to notice here, beloved, that Christ does not descend into Jerusalem and have people sit on earthly thrones. These people are dying, and they are sending to heaven to sit on a throne. Amen? I mean, that's the clear context of this, beloved. Now, thrones, the book of Revelation speaks about God's throne. It speaks about Christ's throne. It speaks about the 24 elders before the throne of God in heaven. But never once does the book of Revelation use the word throne to refer to a saint's throne on earth, especially here. Now, I'm not going to take you through 40 texts. Okay, But I want to take you through a few just so I can prove the point. Because remember, a text out of context is a pretext. Amen? What we want to be able to do is take this verse apart so we can see exactly what it's saying. Not make assumptions. We dare not make speculations that a lot of people do. Let's see what the Bible has to say. Go to Revelation chapter 4. Back up to Revelation chapter 4. Hope I can read it. My Bible's all written. <laughs> Revelation chapter 4, and notice what he says in verse 2. John says, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and I beheld a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Drop down to verse number 6. And before the throne was a sea of glass like unto crystal. In other words, it was transparent glass. God could look through. It's like a two-way mirror. God can look through it to earth, but we can't look up through it to see God in heaven. And he says, And in the midst of the throne, round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Drop down to verses 9 and 10. And when the beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Now, so far, what we've seen is what? This is God's throne. Amen? Nowhere in Revelation will you see man sitting on an earthly throne. That is something that is made up by premillennialists, uh, and dispensationalists 
Nowhere do we find that in Revelation. So if you're going to interpret the Bible, interpret it correctly. Amen? Now go over to chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. Look what he says in verse number 7. And he came and took, that is the Lamb, he came and took the book out of the right hand of him, that's God the Father, that sat upon the throne. Is that an earthly throne or a heavenly throne? Heavenly. Drop down to verse 11. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne. Is that an earthly throne or heavenly throne? Heavenly. And the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, 13. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth, such as are in the sea and all that uh, are in them, heard I saying, Blessed and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, that is, of the universe, and unto the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, forever and ever. Now again, beloved, are those earthly thrones or are those heavenly thrones? Heavenly thrones. Go over to chapter 19 of the book of Revelation. Now remember, you're going to find this all the way through the book of Revelation. I'm just taking selected texts uh, in the, the beginning, in the middle, and ultimately the end. Go over to chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19, verses 4 and 5. It's ta talking about the, how those in heaven are going to praise God. He says, And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat, upon, uh, sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. Now, what have we seen? We've seen that the word thronos in Revelation chapter 4 through 6 refers not to an earthly throne that men sit on. It refers to heavenly thrones that when the dead uh, die, who are saved, who are born again, their soul slips out of their body, and now they go to rule and reign with Christ in heaven. Back up to the book of Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, beginning with verse 21. He's just speaking. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. Where's that throne? Okay? In Revelation chapter 20, verses 4 and 5, these people have been they're, they're beheaded for the word of God. They're overcomers. Amen? Now notice Jesus is promising them that they're going to sit where with him? In heaven, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. So you can see, beloved, this kind of puts a cap on Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. It shows you that when we slip out of our bodies, we have been promised to rule and reign with God throughout the universe. Amen? We're not only going to do it spiritually, but ultimately someday when we receive a glorified body, we will do it literally. But here it's talking about what happens at our death. When we die, every Christian, born again, washed in the blood, he's been uh, born of God, baptized of God, blessed of God. He rises to that higher life in heaven, and he rules, and he reigns with God. Amen? So it's pretty clear right there. Now, I shouldn't have to go into any more text because it's clear enough. That's proof number one. Proof number two. Go back to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, verse number four again. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. 
Now I want you to notice the word souls there. Circle that word. That's the Greek word suke. What's the word? That's the Greek word suke, and it refers to the inner mortal part of man that is different than the outer physical part of man. Now, John says that they were beheaded for the witness of the testimony of Jesus. What does that mean? It means that they physically died, but when they physically died, they still spiritually what? Lived. Their soul slipped out of their body, and they lived forever and ever and ever. So he says the, he saw the souls of them. He didn't say he saw the bodies of them, did he? He didn't say he saw Jesus come down in Jerusalem and sit on a throne in Jerusalem and all the saints ruling with him on an earthly throne in Jerusalem. Again, we're interpreting the Bible literally here. <laughs> we kind of let the text say what it says. So even though, beloved, they were physically killed, in other words, they spiritually lived, death could not terminate their life, neither will it terminate our life. Now, Jesus said this in John 11, 25, uh, 25 and 26. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth in me and believeth in me shall never die. Then he said to Mary, Believest thou this? She said, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Son of God that should come into the world. And then Jesus went on in John 5, 24. He says, He that believeth in me shall never die, but has passed from death unto life, John 5, 24. So we can see that when we physically die, we pass from death unto life, and when we get saved, we pass from spiritual death unto what? Spiritual life. Every person on the top side of this earth is born physically alive, but spiritually dead. They have been separated, severed from the very life of God. Now, most people don't know that. They go about their daily business trying to have fun, trying to make money, trying to get an education. But they don't know that they're one heartbeat, one breath away from meeting the God of the universe. And that God's going to ask them one thing, what did you do with my son Jesus Christ? So no matter what your job is, how much fun you're making, how much money you're making, you better start thinking of your soul. I told you last week in Revelation chapter 20, we see the court scene, the great white throne judgment. We want to settle out of court while we can right now. Amen? Today is the day of your salvation. Now is the time to get saved. Not die and then think you're going to bargain with God. It's over. You've already made your decision. You don't want to be saved. There's no more mercy when you go before the great white throne judgment of God. Now, in Matthew chapter 22, verse 32, you may want to write this text down, put it in your margin. Jesus said this. Jesus said, I am the God of Abraham, and I am the God of Isaac, and I am God, the God of Jacob. He said, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. In other words, Jesus was teaching the Jews of that day that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were still alive, that he had seen them. Remember, he said, before Abraham, wa uh, before Abraham was, I am. They said, thou art not yet 50 years old. Well, Jesus preexisted as the eternal son of the living God. And so he saw Abraham, he saw Isaac, he saw Jacob, not only in their earthly life, but their soul slipped out of their body. And at that time, there was two compartments in hell that was underground. It was known as Abraham's bosom. It was the comforted side of hell that the uh, saints, when they died, they went there. That was Abraham's bosom. That's Luke 16, 19 through 31. And there was the uncomforted side. That is, when those who died not believing in the coming of the Mashiach, of the Messiah, they went to hell until the day of judgment. And the Bible says hell every day is enlarging its borders. Imagine that, beloved. Look at all the funerals that are going on today. I've done enough of them. I'm sick of doing funerals. A lot of people, they give these great swelling eulogies the person was a rascal. They didn't know Jesus as their Savior. And the only heaven they ever knew was the misery that they knew on this earth. 
They went from this kind of misery to eternal misery. So it's no game to be saved, is it? Now, Jesus was trying to prove to his audience, beloved, that even though the patriarchs physically died, they were still spiritually alive. And he said, uh, he tells them that he saw their souls. Now listen to me, beloved. This word soul is used, or suke, is used three times in the book of Revelation. And I always tell you to do is what with me? Check me out. Take your concordance. Check it out. The word soul is used three times in the book of Revelation, and it always refers to the inner being, the immortal part of man that survives death, and it never refers to the uh, physical outer part of the body. I'm going to talk about that a little bit, but I want to look at some scriptures. I want us to look at the three texts where the word souls is used so we can rightly interpret it how it's interpreted right here in the text in Revelation. Amen? Not fair enough? All right. I want you to go to Revelation chapter 6. This is a scary text, by the way. Revelation chapter 6. Verse 9, John says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Now notice, beloved, these are the martyrs. In Christ's day, a lot of Christians were dying. And then there was the Roman persecution. There was ten Roman persecutions that were empire-wide. There were many localized persecutions where Christians were being arrested, fed the lions. They were being, uh, imagine having seen your, your kid being eaten by a lion right in front of your eyes. They were being burned at the stake. So there was many localized uh, uh, persecutions, but there was 10 empire-wide Roman persecutions where Christians were hunted down like dogs. In fact, what happened a lot of times, they would dress up a Christian in a, they would skin a lamb and put his, his uh, wool and skin over him with all the blood. Then they make him run into the arena and they send the wolves and the lions after him. Those rapacious beasts would tear them apart savagely. That's how much they hated Christians. But we see here, beloved, notice what he says uh, in verse 10. And they cry with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord? holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? White robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. In other words, the martyrs were being told this. They're crying out, Lord, we want justice, not vengeance, justice. He says, wait a little bit. Be patient, because there's a lot of martyrs that are yet going to die for the faith. All throughout the church age, millions and millions of Christians, the most persecuted people in the world today are what? Not the Jews, even though we are against what's going on right now in Israel, about the Hamas, what they're doing to the Jews. The most persecuted people on earth are Christians today. But you don't hear that from the news media because they don't want to talk about it. But that's, the, that's a fact. You can look it up yourself if you want to. But the Bible teaches that there's not only was great martyrdom at that time, and that goes to show you in Revelation chapter 20, these souls are the people that have been what? They have been martyred. I mean, it's fulfillment of Revelation 6-9. But he's also saying that there's going to be more people that are going to die. As we read the book of the Revelation, we know that in the last days, Martyrdom is coming to the church on this earth. It's coming to America. A lot of Christians right now, pastors have been arrested, dragged out of their churches. I know during the COVID-19, they threatened me left and right because I, I wouldn't shut down. And a lot of pastors were arrested. They were dragged out. They kept saying, we're going, you know, I, I remember I told you, I said, they probably came here on a Sunday. And they said, well, they must be obeying us because we're not open. <laughs> because we worship on a Sunday. So he's a good little boy. Yeah, George, he's a good little boy. But, but the, the, 
What I'm saying to you, beloved, is Jesus warned us, think it not strange that persecution is going to come upon you. Don't think it's strange when you're going to be martyred. You know, it used to be when you said you were a Christian, people said, hallelujah, they trusted you, they wanted to hire you. Now you're a bear in their saddle. Now you're a fundamentalist. Now you're the one that stands against abortion. You're the one that stands against all of these immoral sins that they're doing. we got to get rid of you so we can have some peace on this earth. And I want to tell you something, beloved. Don't you ever renounce Christ. He says, if you didn't, in, in, in uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 31, 32, Jesus says, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before the Father. We need to be prepared to take our licks, amen? We know that if we die physically, we'll live spiritually, and then we'll live physically again in a new glorified body. So that was the first mention of souls in the book of Revelation. Now it's mentioned two other times. I want you to go to Revelation chapter 18. In Revelation chapter 18, And here it's talking about uh, uh, the fall of Babylon, and it's talking about the economic portion of it. But he says in verse 13, And cinnamon, and odors, and ointments, and frankincense, this is the merchandise uh, God is showing us in the last days, what's going to happen to our economy, and it's going to be a great depression. And wine, and oil, and fine flour, and wheat, and beasts, and sheep, and horses, and chariots, and slaves, and souls of men. Again, that's the second use of the word soul, not referring to a physical being, but his inner being. Amen? Number three is in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. John says he saw the souls of them uh, that were beheaded. So, beloved, these texts, Revelation chapter 6, verse 9, Revelation chapter 18, verse 13. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. They all refer to the souls of the faithfully martyred and departed who at death have gone to live on with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. And whenever that word is used in the book of the Revelation, beloved, it is always used referring to the inner man. Now, sometimes in Scripture you will see the word soul used for the physical person. And whenever it is used like that in Scripture, there's normally a numerica, numerical qualifier that's affixed to it. For example, let me show you what I'm saying. The Bible says there were eight souls on Noah's ark. Now we know that the soul's referring to not just the inner man, but the outer man. But notice the numerical qualifier there. There was what? Eight souls. So we know contextually that he's talking about the physical body. Amen? And then, beloved, when we study the Apostle Paul, when he was shipwrecked, the Bible says there was 276 souls that were on this ship with Paul when he was on his way to Rome. Now, the numerical qualifier is 276 souls. So the context is pretty clear there, isn't it? So when we see, when we go through the Scriptures, that God uses souls for the inner man and the outer man. 99% of the time when he's talking about the outer man, there's some type of numerical qualifier or something in the context that will reveal exactly what he's talking about. So we've looked at proof number one. We've looked at the word thrones. Number two, we've looked at the word soul, suke. Proof number three, I want you to go to Revelation chapter 20 again. We're going to spend some time on this. Give it a few minutes here. Verse number six. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now notice, beloved, the first resurrection ensures us that we will be priests unto God. Some three times the New Testament teaches that those who get saved are already, past tense, been made 
priests unto God, not that someday they will be made priests unto God when Christ comes back. That's how the premillennialist interprets it. But the Bible teaches us that the moment we get saved, we already become a priest of God. Would you say amen? So this is already an established fact, beloved, that all saints during their lifetime, from the moment we get saved, have become priests unto God. Now, I always tell you, we prove it from Scripture. Amen? I want to go to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, and look at verse 5 and then verse 9. Peter says in verse 5, You also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. I'll drop right down to verse number 9. But ye are a chosen generation. Now notice, you are already a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him that have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now let me ask you, beloved, are we priests and kings unto God the moment we get saved, yes or no? So John says in Revelation chapter 20, verse 6, that these people that experienced the first resurrection are made kings and priests unto God. That is, not sometime in the future, but when they got what? When they got saved. I want you to look at Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Of course, John, this is his greeting to the seven churches. And from Jesus Christ, he says, verse 5, who was the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us, notice the past tense, and washed us, notice the past tense, from our sins in his own blood and hath already made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Now let me ask you something. Did you become a priest of God and a, a uh, king of God when you got saved? So Revelation chapter 20, verse 6, when it says that we made priests unto God, it's not talking about sometime in the future in a 1,000-year millennial kingdom. It's talking about something that had already happened in the past in these saints and souls' lives. Amen? Alrighty, I'm going to have to stop here because my, my time's running out. But beloved, I just want to end by saying this, that Christians have the wonderful privilege of being royal, a royal priesthood and kings under God on this earth uh, until the Lord Jesus Christ come back. The word priest means a bridge builder. We, bri we build bridges to God. In other words, if I share the gospel with Tom, he's not saved. I share the gospel with him. I'm trying to get him reconciled with God. I'm trying to bridge that gap between Tom, who's lost, and God, who's reaching down, trying to reconcile him, connect him to himself. Amen? So we're priests. We have that privilege of being priests, a royal priesthood under God. Every time you share the gospel, you're trying to reconnect people back with God because they're separated from God. They're lost. And if they die, they'll go straight to hell. And so our job as a royal priesthood and kings under God is to reconcile them to God. And we offer up the sweet-smelling incense of spiritual sacrifices. The Bible says in our prayers to God as we intercede one for another. You know, the Bible says that when we pray, our prayers are sent up to God like sweet-smelling incense, and God's there smelling it. And it brings us right back to the temple. When you went into the Holy of Holies, there was the altar of incense, always burning. And it was always commemorating the prayers of the saints that were ascending up before God. And God dwelt between the cherubim on the mercy seat over the Ark of the Covenant. Amen? 
All right, we're going to have to stop right there. And next week, Lord willing, the crypto rise will pick up on it. Any questions? About